Hello everyone, welcome to 10 Minute Physiology. In today's video, I'm going to give you a short explanation as to how excitation contraction coupling works in the heart. Now in this video, I'm primarily going to be focusing on how contraction is initiated and how it's regulated. We're not really going to be talking about the mechanism as to how the heart contracts. That is going to be a video in itself. So with that, let's begin. So I'd like to start off by first talking about what cardiomyocytes look like in the first place. So cardiomyocytes are the muscle cells that make up the heart. And the first thing that you should see in the cardiomyocytes that we see from this figure here is that the cardiomyocytes have a nucleus. So the nucleus is also going to be seen with these microfibrils. So microfibrils are basically these arrangements of something called sarcomeres. So sarcomeres are basically the contractile units of the muscle cells. So the sarcomeres are going to contain actin and myosin fibers, and these actin and myosin fibers are going to be responsible for contracting the muscle. So one thing that you should take note of about cardiomyocytes is that they are striated. So they're striated very much like how the skeletal muscle is striated. Now one distinguishing feature about the cardiomyocytes is that they have these intercalated discs. Now the intercalated discs are very interesting and we're going to take a closer look at what these intercalated discs actually are. So this is a zoom in of the two cells. And what we see here are two cells that are adjacent to each other. Now, the first thing that you'll notice inside these cells is that they have these yellow and blue lines. So these yellow and blue lines are actually the actin and myosin fibers. So these actin and myosin fibers are going to be arranged in a specific way in the sarcomere. And remember, the sarcomere is the contractile unit of the cell. So it's the actin and myosin that are going to be responsible for contracting the muscle. Now, in this video, we're not really going to be focusing on how this contraction occurs. We're going to be talking about how the contraction is initiated and regulated. Now, after that, we see something else in the intercalated discs. And this is going to be the gap junctions. And this is probably the most important part of the intercalated disc. So the gap junction is basically a channel protein that connects two adjacent cells together. And, and these channels allow the flow of ions back and forth between cells. So it's a quick way for two cells to communicate with one another. So things like positive charge, negative charge, or different molecules can pass from cell to cell actually rather quickly. And it allows the heart to act as an electrical synestatium. The other important part of the intercalated disc is going to be the desmosome. So the desmosome is going to be a protein that sort of anchors the two cells together. It helps to keep the adjacent cells together. So now that we know how these cells look and what the intercalated discs are, we can now talk about excitation contraction coupling. So with that, let's take a look at what it is. So this right here is a figure or a close-up image of the plasma membrane of a cardiomyocyte. And in this figure here, we see a few interesting things. So the first thing is that we see this divot in the plasma membrane. This divot has a specific name and it's called the T-tubule. And it's going to be really important and we're going to talk about that later in this slide. Um, the next thing that you should see here is this figure. So this figure that sort of looks like a cowboy hat is, a, also is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a specific name for the endoplasmic reticulum that's in the muscle cells. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is inside the cell and it's actually going to have a very high calcium concentration, which is going to be very important for excitation contraction coupling. Before we talk about how excitation contraction coupling occurs, I want to bring up a specific pump that you've probably heard about, the sodium potassium pump. So the sodium potassium pump is going to pump three sodiums out of the cell and it's going to pump two so potassiums into the cell. 
Now, the result of this is that the sodium potassium pump makes the inside of the cell be low in sodium concentration and high in potassium concentration. So this is good, this concentration gradient for sodium is actually going to be very important for removing calcium from the cell. And we'll get to that in a little bit. So now that we know what the sodium potassium pump is and what these two structures are, let's talk about how excitation contraction coupling occurs. So in order to initiate excitation contraction coupling, you have a stimulus that travels down the T-tubule and it goes to the L-type calcium channel. Now this stimulus is going to be a depolarization and the depolarization causes the L-type calcium channel to open. Now when the L-type calcium channel opens, it allows calcium to flow from the extracellular fluid into the intracellular fluid. Now when calcium enters into the cell inside the intracellular fluid, it will interact with the receptors on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And these receptors are the ryanidine receptors. So the calcium that entered into the cell through the L-type calcium channel will interact with the ryanidine receptors to open them. And when they open, it allows calcium to flow from the inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol. So this type of calcium release is called calcium-induced calcium release, or CICR. So in other words, the calcium that came into the cell from the L-type calcium channels opening interacts with the ryanidine receptors, which allows the ryanidine receptors to open and allows calcium to flow from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm. So from this, you get a lot of calcium entering into the cytosol. Now, from the combined actions of these two things, you increase the calcium level inside the cytosol. And then this increased calcium level will interact with the contractile fibrils inside the cell, so the actin and myosin, and it will initiate contraction. And once again, we'll talk about how this occurs in a later video. So contraction occurs inside the muscle cells when you increase the calcium level. So how do we remove this calcium from the cytosol and stop or terminate the contraction? Because the heart has to stop contracting in order to relax. Because during relaxation, the heart will fill up with blood so it can pump again and pump that blood to the rest of the body. So how will the cell remove this calcium from the cytosol in order to terminate contraction? So this is going to be done primarily through th four mechanisms. And the first mechanism is going to be through the circa pump. So the circa pump is going to hydrolyze ATP into ADP and use that energy in order to pump calcium from the cytosol back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The second way is going to be through the sodium-calcium exchanger. So the sodium-calcium exchanger uses the sodium gradient that was generated by the sodium-potassium pump to pump calcium out of the cell. So in other words, the sodium-potassium pump made it so that the concentration of sodium inside the cell is a lot lower than, than the sodium concentration outside the cell. So in other words, there is going to be an inward sodium gradient. And when you bring sodium from the extracellular fluid into the intracellular fluid, this will release energy, and this energy will be uh, applied to the exchanger, and it will allow calcium to flow out of the cell. So this is something called secondary active transport. So you use the downward electrochemical gradient of one ion or molecule to drive the uphill transport of another uh, ion. So that is what is being done with the sodium calcium exchanger. The third way is going to be through the PMCA or plasma membrane calcium ATPase, which hydrolyzes ATP into ADP, and it uses that energy to pump calcium out of the cell. And then the last way is going to be through the mitochondria. So 70% of the calcium inside the cytosol is going to be removed by the circa pump. So this is going to be responsible for the majority of calcium removal from the cytosol. 28% is going to be done through the exchanger. 
and 1% is going to be done through the PMCA, and then the remaining 1% is going to be going into the mitochondria itself. So now that we know how excitation contraction coupling works, let's talk about some of the ways in which it's regulated. So one way is going to be through the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is going to increase heart rate. And when you increase our heart rate, you have to increase the rate at which excitation contraction coupling occurs. So you have to increase the rate at which this whole process occurs. So how does it do it? So the way it does it is that the sympathetic nervous system acts through the beta adrenergic receptor, specifically the beta-1 adrenergic receptor. And the beta-1 adrenergic receptor is a GS protein-coupled receptor. So when norepinephrine comes in from the sympathetic nervous system and binds to the adrenergic receptor, it activates GS, and the GS will move to adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase converts ATP into cyclic AMP, and then cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A. So protein kinase A is going to phosphorylate a number of different proteins. The first protein is going to be the L-type calcium channel. And when it phosphorylates the L-type calcium channel, it basically stabilizes the open state of this channel. So in other words, this channel is easier to open, and when it's open, it stays open longer. So it allows more calcium to flow through it. So when this channel is phosphorylated, it increases the amount of calcium that flows through the channel. The second target of PKA is going to be the ryanidine receptor, and the phosphorylation of the ryanidine receptor is going to have a similar effect that phosphorylation had on the calcium channel phosphorylation of the ryanidine receptor increases the open probability, allowing more calcium to flow from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol. And the last thing that it targets is going to be the circa pump. So the, uh, the specific thing that it's going to target on the circa pump is going to be phospholambin B. So phospholambin B is a regulatory protein that binds to the circa pump and it regulates its activity. So when phospholambin B is phosphorylated, which is what PKA does, so PKA phosphorylates phospholambin B, the phospholambin B basically takes away the inhibitory effects on circa. So when it's phosphorylated, when phospholambin B is phosphorylated, the circa pump is activated and its activation increases the rate at which calcium is removed by the, from, the, from the cytosol. And when you increase the rate at which calcium is removed from the cytosol, you allow the heart to relax faster. Because in order for the heart rate to increase, you also have to decrease the time needed for the heart to relax. So by increasing the activity of the circa pump, you increase the rate of relaxation, which therefore helps the heart rate to increase as well. So all of these things are going to work together in order to uh, facilitate the increase in heart rate. There are also um, another uh, opposite effect that you can get from the parasympathetic nervous system. And the parasympathetic nervous system will do the exact opposite of the beta adrenergic receptor through the GI protein. So the GI protein is going to inhibit adenylate cyclase, which decreases the activity of PKA. And then all the things that I said that happen to these different proteins, it's going to be the reverse. So this right here is a summary of everything we talked about. So we talked about how the cardiomyocytes are going to be striated muscles of the heart, and they are going to have intercalated discs with many gap junctions. We also talked about the process of excitation contraction coupling, where you start with a stimulus propagating down the T-tubule, opening L-type calcium channels. The calcium then enters the cell and stimulates calcium-induced calcium release. The calcium then stimulates cardiac contraction, and then calcium is removed from the cytoplasm via these four ways. Then we talked about how excitation contraction coupling is regulated through the beta adrenergic receptor. And when it's stimulated, we saw that all of these three targets were phosphorylated, which facilitated the uh, heart rate increasing. 
So I hope this video helped you understand what excitation contraction coupling is and how it's regulated. And I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you next time.